a really brief introduction. Chris is driving Science DMZ uh, in, within Rnet and has been doing that for quite a long time. Uh, that'll do. Right. Yep. Hi, all. Um, so we're going to talk about Science DMZ or friction-free networking. Um, we're going to move through the slides pretty quick because there's lots of slides and not a lot of time. So um, if you have any feelings about slides, yell at me. And um, you know, don't be shy about asking questions as we go along or interacting. Cause if you strongly disagree with something I say, because you can, um, let me know and we can have a, a chat about it. All right? Okay, overview. So everyone can read. Feel free to read. So basically, it's a bit of your network that helps you enable research, okay? It's segregated and optimised for high-speed data transfers or gaining access to other high-intensity data research needs or computation. It's four key parts. So it's an architecture explicitly designed for high throughput, right? High design for data... It's designed for data transfer, performance measurement and network testing systems, so we know basically how the network performs end to end all the time. So there's an expectation that we know how things work. It has the right security policies and enforcement for that type of science or that type of data. It's different to what you put in front of, say, your HR system. It's a different type of security than you put in front of a petabyte of public domain satellite imaging, right? Big things here. Reduce or eliminate packet loss, because that's really important when you want to move stuff fast. As soon as you get loss, it's you're over, right? So driving loss to zero within your network infrastructure. Appropriate security architecture, so don't kill the transfer because you decided to tick the box that say you're going to layer seven inspect, as I said, a petabyte of public domain satellite data, because it's really, no one's going to read the logs. There's a lot of them, right? There's lots and lots. Um, provide an on-ramp for local science resources. So really push the data out there. Virtual circuits, SDN, all the different technologies that can overlay into this technology. And testing and measurement. Because um, it's really good to have, like really, really important to have all this capacity, but if it doesn't work, there's not much point in having it. So making sure it works when you need it. Because as we know, science... Networks, they go like this and then nothing. Right? And in the nothing period, you don't want to do a change and go, yep, everything's good. And then next time it tries to ramp, it only goes halfway. So this is how we can predict that it's going to keep ramping whenever it's required. OK, different models. This is what a university campus network, simplified down to one thing, pretty much looks like, right? You've got your Rnet, your NTU, your border router, IDSs, firewalls, inline security devices, all the things that keep our user community safe and a lot of the time the people outside of our community safe from the nutters inside the university that we have. Um, and then all of our campus data and all those sorts of things. Really important, really tough to transverse that um, firewall, especially when you've got things like uh, a grid FTP where, you know, scientist says, I want to use grid FTP, and you go, yeah, no problem. They go, I need 10,000 ports open incoming from anywhere in the world. And you go, no. And they go, but then it won't work. And you go, no. And they go, but it won't work. And then you go, no. And if you actually follow the full grid FTP um, concept, it's actually every port over 1024 needs to be open. So it's not actually 10,000. They just shrink it down to make it more palatable for people. Because you can set it to whatever you want, and it's a server-based communication back into the client. So really basic science teams add real low cost. So some items to introduce here, persona nodes. They're the testing elements. Bezers are kind of like a distributor for the, the um, border router. Then you've got your DTNs, which are actually your transfer nodes. So they're the bits that push your data. Because on your LAN, all your machines, all your servers, you tune for a LAN. All your Unix boxes that you put in straight off the CD, or unless you've actually gone in and modified the tuning in them, they're tuned for a WAN, or worse. right? Because some of our WANs are pretty fast now but they're tuned for like one gig networks. So you need to specially tune DTNs so they go further, and we'll get into that later. Um, you can bring in other bits of the network into this with this same model, and you're sharing this, is, you're sharing this um, traffic coming from the PE into the NTU and into the border. So this is one way of looking at it. 
but you're breaking out that traffic. So you're feeding, still got your security through your firewall, but you've got uh, a breakout to your data intense research needs. So you can start to push some real data without getting limitations through the firewall. A better model. We're actually taking separate feeds, separate core connects from our net and ripping them into separate infrastructures, so separate routers, so they're not going through your border. There's no contention with your link that you've got your production traffic running over. So you're actually able to build better flows and bigger flows, okay? And one DTN may not be enough. So you can actually build grids of these and connect them to your research storage stands in the back. So you can push lots and lots of data by building data grids. And you can run different types of applications because we know the GridFTP, Aspira, um, WGET, curl, threads, whole heap of different stuff out there. Your science community uses what the community uses, not what you tell them to do. So that's something to remember. So the software, you can't go, I want the science TMZ software stack. And you go, well, there's lots of them because every community is different. What's your research community want? And that's one of the questions that needs to be answered before you get too far into this. You can put lots of overlays, glyphs, 100 gig, SDN, so VPNs through it. So you can start layering technologies over the top of this. So to enable different types of workflows to your researchers or research intensive data needs. You can put lots of things into it, right? So it's not just about data transfer. So Sone, Steam, Z, the data part we talk about a lot because it's important and it's really hard to do. But you can put a whole heap of other instruments, caves, visualizations, HPC systems, storage, test beds. You can overlay all this technology and leverage this architecture for this same need. A little bit on security, I won't go too far. Um, so think about it, the red is your enterprise world, right? Tighten it down, right? Really tighten it down. The blue is your science DMZ educational needs. Um, the requirements are less. You know, like, yes, there's um, medical data and things like that, but it's different to your HA data, um, HR, personal files, loans, financial records of the university. As an enterprise network, you can tighten. So separating these two data paths out, you can tighten your enterprise security while still allowing, still putting security in your research area, but making it focused on research outcomes and research needs. Some basic stuff, sysadmin 101. Firewalls, turn on the firewalls on the DTN servers. V4, V6, you know, only allow what's in required. Um, remove any services are not required, you know, so if you're just using a Spira, there's only a few ports you need open, so just open those and turn everything else off on the server. So nail your servers down and log. The only warning with logging, we had one experience with, uh, between two universities. This particular user had 31 terabytes of 10K files. When you're throwing that many file opens and closes across the internet um, between two sites, we were actually crashing log D in the Unix systems. Just with it reporting, I've opened a file and I've written a file. Right? So you've got to, logging's important, but you've got to make sure the logging doesn't kill the machine doing the transfer. Because it can actually slow down your transfers. ACLs on the, we want to have the ACLs, whack them on there, right? Get them up, get all the normal stuff out. Um, there's a whole heap of ACL work and logging on the network as well. I have, this is where you may yell at me. Um, a lot of inline devices are horrible in this environment. Like if you have 100 gig transfers going on and you put your inline security devices in there that may be labeled to go at a certain speed, test them that they do go at a certain speed. Because lots of them don't. Your 10 gig firewalls don't all run at 10 gig, single flow or multi flow, right? Test them. We have gear we'll talk about later that you can borrow to test your, test your kit. Um, IDSs, deep packet inspection, things like that don't work at these speeds yet. So you need to think about that when you're designing this. So like it might be, it's a requirement, but is it a requirement that will actually work? and meet the outcome. Um, inline tapping can be done. And um, there's an, a link here for um, bro clustering, which is a type of IDS. That have, there's been some success in the US of doing this with um, high speed flows into you know, 10, 30 node clusters running bro. Um, so you need to start thinking that part or 
hit up your artificial intelligence guys. Performance. Performance is really important when you start talking about data. As you see, the big numbers at the top and how long it takes to move it and the speed required to move it at. So when we start talking about large, like even you know, anything above 100 terabytes to a petabyte, we're sort of talking about visibly aging before you get to the point that you've downloaded or moved your data, right? And faster outcomes for research, the sooner they get the data and can work on it or move their data somewhere to be processed, the sooner they get an outcome. So if we can enable these to move faster, um, you know, like say, uh, one petabyte, 30 days, um, if, we're, um, if we're running at three, gig, um, three gigabits per second, right? Sustain rates. That's doable. You know, um, 100 petabytes, 300 and, you know, 308 gigabits per second is probably harder, right? A lot harder. This is another way of looking at the same thing. In one second, how fast can I move my data? So with a 100 gig flow, in one second, it's either 900 megabits or 9 gig in the same period of time, and as you push it down, right? So you've got to think about, you know, when you start looking at the month and 24 petabytes, you know, some different type of science is enabled to us. So there's lots of stuff that people look at and go, I can't do that because I can't get to the data or I can't move the data or I'll do a subset of it and sample down. System selection. So this is where it gets a bit hardware-y, so um, for servers. So there's a list here, server brands, not important, motherboards, PCI buses are important, memory, not so important. If you put lots of disk in it, need more memory, you know, just, just to keep the, the disk happy. CPUs are really important, NICs are really, really, really important, and hard drives are super important in this space, right? Whether it's the, your SAN performance, if you're just proxying through a DTN, or if you're writing to scratch on the local DTN, the choice of hard drives, how you lay them out, and how many you put in there, totally determines the speed of your system and of your NAS. Like if you're gonna put in a, go, I wanna do 50, 50, um, 50 megabits or 50 megabytes per second, and I don't have the right SAN infrastructure, you just can't do it, right? Lots of places you sit there and they, you, you, they've got beautiful InfiniBand, DDN SANs and all that, and they go, and here's the NFS connection from the one machine I got plugged into it on the edge on FDR. Right? And you can, they go, why isn't it going really fast? Well, because of all those things you just told me you did, right? Yes, the storage is beautiful. The other thing is know how you're using your SAN. You know, um, there's one place we're working at, beautiful SAN, all great, really big cluster connected to it that kept it really busy. We, put, we started sucking data out of it really quickly. That one SAN was really, really busy. The HPC node just disconnected because they couldn't talk to it anymore because the storage was too busy. I know this doesn't sound obvious, but when you go buy a server, check out the wiring diagrams of how it's actually wired inside because you'll be really surprised how many times it'll be an X16 port but it's actually wired at eight or four. Right, and you plug it in and go, why is this going slow? Or your storage is totally disconnected or your CPU spread across your Ethernet, you know? Like in this one, you can see all the um, PCI buses are all connected to socket two and none of them are connected to socket one. So you can only use socket two for all your transfers. So you you know, that socket one CPU or socket, yeah, socket one on this one doesn't do anything. It just looks after the disk. So you've kind of um, wasted a bit of time and a bit of money on that. Also, and then there's a wiring example. Cores, gigahertz is, is king, right? Higher the gigahertz, the higher your single flow throughput is. And also, latest tech, right? Sandy Bridge V2 will do X versus Broadwell Skylark. They will do more, right? So it's important, you can't go, I've got some spare machines that I'm not using anymore. I'll use these as my transfer nodes. Your peak flow for performance won't be any good. You need good, new, high-tech, fast stuff to enable the throughput. Cores. Cores are sometimes the answer, but not always the answer. So you can start multi-flowing really well. So you can build up four or five multi-flows at 20 gig per core, 
at you know 2.6 or 3 gigahertz per second of um, a new model um, processor and do pacing for that and that'll work really well. But if you go, I want a single, single flow on a 2.6 Sandy Bridge V2, I'll only get to like 40 gig maximum with a single flow. Where if I've got a brand new one, I can get to 76. So decisions on purchasing make a really big difference. Hyperthreading, turn it off, right? No place in data transfer hyperthreading. It's a web for web servers and file servers. Nix, super important, right? They're not all equal. Some you'll get and they will not perform the same as the others. They may even have this, like pretty much the two chipsets in most of them. The implementation of those chipsets are very, very different, right? So make sure you're pushing them and 10 gig is about the same price as 25 gig, so no, why not buy 25 gig NICs? Hardware, storage elements, make sure you know how everything's plugged in because there's back plane components that are plugged in and aggregated down or aggregated up. So it's really important you really dig in. You know, to do 10 gig, you need 24 standard drives just for the spindle speed or 10 SSDs or you know, four NVMEs will give you 100 gigabits per second, right? It's a really big difference. System tuning, 9K MTUs, or you're just wasting your time, right? Buffers, 100 gig, you, two gig worth of buffers you're putting in. Congestion protocols, pick one, not the one that comes with it. BIOS settings, you have to change the BIOS for performance. They're not designed to go fast out of the box. They're, they're designed to be energy efficient, you know? A bit like a Volkswagen. Okay, CPU frequency, like power frequency. You actually have to go in there and tell it to run fast, right? You can also go in and tell it exactly how fast to run. It's really important. Fair queuing, bunch of smart people, this is awesome. Only available in the latest kernels, really, really good. You can even set packet pacing per flow. So you can say, I won't allow a flow to be above 10 gig, right? And you can set flows and stack them. Really way to get, really good way of getting smooth transfers. Affinity. As you went back to the wiring diagram, unless you've got the right core going to the right NIC, it's always going to transfer between the two CPUs and you've wasted your time, right? Lock your program to the core that the NICs attached. You know, it's almost twice the performance if you do that. Okay? Um, and beware of the Dells, they number differently to everyone else. Like they do odds and evens. Everyone else does one socket, does the first bit, the second socket, does the others. It's a good trick for you. Um, MLX tune, really easy way to work out which CPU is on which card because it tells you when you do the report. So it's worth having a look at if you're running OFED drivers. Some tests, so we've done some work with NCI, so Andrew up the end there. Um, you can see this is affinity locked through the network. It was basically proved that we could actually drive things at those speeds. So in here you can see we're getting up over 80 gigabits per second with multi-flow transfers. And that's between multiple switches, but just between two machines, <coughs> two servers. So, you know, when you build a data grid, there's no problem filling 100 gig. We're not doing that now, right? Same here, same with UDT and TCP. Here's all the raw numbers, you know? 87.77. And one of these processors is a Sandy Bridge version 2, 2.4 gigahertz processor, right? So if that was a modern processor, we'd be kicking up around 93, 94 gigabits per second. Software, Spira, huge difference. It's when you're driving transfers. Globus, again, huge difference. But it's not as free as it thinks. As soon as you want to do groups or authentication, it costs money. So don't get tricked by it. It's just open source. Benchmarking. We've got servers on the backbone. You can borrow servers from us, take them home. We've got seven of them. Um, take them back to your institution and test against two known good hosts on the backbone. So you can actually see what your firewalls are doing. Test boxes for you to take home. And there's our new one. Right, so Stephen Walsh's new little beasties. These are awesome. Two one gig NICs, really fast. Okay, Arnett X. This is a, the new product that um, David's been talking about. 
It's a community enabler, it's a community driver, right? We can really help support our research community to do new and different types of research with this type of infrastructure if we can leverage it correctly. Right? It's going to be high performance and low cost. My stick figure drawing of it. Yes, so that's there. So multi drops, one in each state via um, and one territory via Tasmania and Northern Territory. Um, monitoring, weather maps, OOB, um, all 100 gig interconnected, and all this stuff can scale out. You can keep bonding devices. So the first drop, we're going to drop with um, Mellanox SN2100s, which are 16 port, 100 gig switches. So think about it how you would design a DC network, we're extending that network out into the core. So some of the cool things you can do in the DC network, we can extend out to the core. So something to think about that could be interesting. And we're going to be doing using Cumulus software to start with, so it's going to be SDN based. So it's going to be an SDN 100 gig backbone, right? You don't trip over them anywhere in the world too often, right? So this is new, so we're going to need your help to work on it. So we want to find partners that can um, connect, try things out, make sure it works. Um, it's going to be, it's, it's an exciting new, new stepping stone for us. And those testing I showed before was done on that equipment with that, with Cumulus on it. As a, as a group, right, we have failed. Every time a researcher sends a USB key, sends a CD or DVD, sends a hard disk drive, right, in the post, and it happens all the time. It happens between buildings, right? We need to work out why that's happening, help them to move their data in a better, more efficient way. You know, there's still people out there we've seen that put storage arrays in their boot because their data requirements are that big. So they drive somewhere, download the data onto the array, bring it back, put it in the rack. We've got these massive networks, like really cool university networks, really cool backbone. Let's start leveraging it as a community and together and push it forward. And that's me. Thank you. And I'm